with regard to the uh, Dragon's Den thing, I'm actually stepping down next season. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, it was great fun. It's a great show. I hope everybody you know, continues to tune in because it does really reinforce um, how much courage it takes, all those people. Has anyone seen the show before? Has anyone seen the show? Yeah, lots of people. Um, how much courage all those uh, entrepreneurs have in stepping up in front of a national audience and, and risking their all. And so much of the change that we see in society is done by you know, entrepreneurs and, and founders that, that, uh, that are leading the way. And I have a tremendous amount of respect uh, for, for everyone who, who seeks that kind of um, avenue of their, their uh, outlet and, and creativity. But um, so one of the companies I run is a company called Karma. We have about 50 people. It's, it's headquartered in Cork. Uh, we have offices in Dublin and San Francisco and Washington and Austin uh, and, uh, and whatnot. But just to start uh, the presentation, um, I'd like everyone just to reflect on a, a great uh, quote from Buckminster Fuller, um, which maybe you've heard before. You've never, you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So that's so true, and we can all think of how that, in our very own, very little short lives, even you students, um, how the models have changed and reinvented how we use so much and how we interact with people and everything from cell phones, which really didn't exist when I was growing up, they didn't exist at all, to mobile computing and connected computing with the iPhone, which is only something like six years old. I actually asked my, I, I said to my daughter once, um, well, my daughter said to me, Dad, when you were growing up, did they have cars? <laughs> and, I, and I said, uh, you know, because she'd seen some old pictures of Ginsale with horse-drawn carriages and, and things like that. I said, no, yeah, yeah, they had cars, but man hadn't yet landed on the moon. And, she's, and I told my daughter, I said, when you were born, Charlotte, uh, they didn't have the iPhone. And she said, no. <laughs> she couldn't believe or conceive of a world that didn't exist without this most central of devices. And, and, yet, and yet, the existing model of how people used computing is now obsolete. The, the old way where people used desktop computers and applications that ran on their, on their local personal computer is completely new and complete, completely changed with, with all the apps that we use on our phones, on our <coughs> tablets, and on the internet itself. I'm credited, as was mentioned, with inventing the term uh, cloud computing. Um, that, was a, that was a new and big idea you know, 20 years ago. And it takes a long time sometimes to bring those, uh, to bring that to reality, but uh, that, that made the existing model at, of the day completely obsolete. It's changed our lives, and billions of people use that technology. Another, another company I created, MapInfo, we did that thing, if, has anyone ever typed an address into a computer and seen a street map? We did that, right? And so I use that even getting here on my mobile phone. Billions of people on the planet have used that technology. It totally obsoleted paper maps. How many people carry paper maps in their car anymore? You know? so, so when we think about reinventing transportation, when we think about, uh, when we think about reinventing our lives uh, to some new future, we do have to think about not, not just sort of saying, no, we can't do it that way, but inventing totally new systems which just make irrelevant the old way of doing things. And that's what I'd like everyone to think about in trying to make a more environmental and uh, uh, you know, ecologically conscious world, because the world that we're entering into is actually you know, getting more and more uh, unsustainable uh, every, every year, one, would, one could argue. And just to put this in, in, in context for some of us who haven't traveled the world, you know, the population of the US and the population of all the countries in Europe, 
combined is less than the population of either India or China. It's kind of you know, overwhelmingly uh, interesting because some of us have, have different ways of, of thinking about it. But when you, when you look at this, this picture of a beach or different beaches, and these are just different areas in China, and, and you think, wow, you know, there's a whole, there's whole different uh, world that we're not exposed to. There's 171 cities with over a million population in mainland China. There's only 10 in the United States. You can name you, all of you, most of you probably, can name 10 US cities, but there'd be a very rare number of you that could name more than three cities in China. Just think of them. How many, can, can anyone name more than three cities in China? Yeah, you got some Chinese guys. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Everybody knows three, but that's about it. And one of them is in mainland China. You know, Hong Kong, everybody thinks of Hong Kong. But, uh, but you know, nobody thinks of, like, Dalian, which is six, the 35th largest city in China and still has 50% larger population than all of Ireland, 6.2 million population, which is where we have one of our offices. But, but uh, so, so what you don't know actually can hurt you if, you think, if you're thinking from an environmental perspective because you know, the environment is one environment. It's not, uh, it, it's not just uh, limited by country borders. The, you know, we all know about oil production. It, it hit its peak um, in uh, 2006, even with all of the, um, what do they call it, uh, the shale, or the uh, fracking and things like that, uh, which, which has reduced the price somewhat for, for oil, but still is, it, it's not, it, we still haven't uh, come back to the peak oil production. But what's, what's interesting is that by 2035, you know, China will actually uh, consume close to 60% of the world's oil production, which is pretty weird, considering they're only one-sixth of the world's population. And, and so, uh, you know, we, we do face environmental challenges. And unfortunately, unlike, unlike what we'd like to think, people really don't care about the environment. They care about their environment, maybe, but they don't care about the environment. <laughs> And they don't care about the environment in the future. They care about the environment in their backyard. Um, and that's, that means that there's less urgency around these issues than, than we'd like there to be. I'll let that speak for itself. So what we have to do is take you know, a, a, a vision that, 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 we, that we have you know, um, for a brighter future and a more aware future and execute it, you know, because, you know, unless we have lots and lots of uh, initiatives, a thousand points of light, as it were, um, we're never going to be able to uh, address the, the challenges that we face. I'll take one, one initiative, Karma, that's the company that I'm, I'm running uh, in uh, headquartered in Cork, as I mentioned. So, you know, this is, we tackle this problem because we think it's one of the central problems facing the world. You know, it's, it's a huge, huge uh, issue because basically six billion people need to get to work every day and they're all doing it uh, in a highly inefficient way. So, and, you know, and increasingly so, even if you look at the, the China example, it was like three years ago that China became the number one market for cars in the world. And if you've ever been in any Chinese city, you recognize that the, the demand for cars is skyrocketing and continues to skyrocket. And it's there, it's not just in India, it's everywhere. Um, but, uh, but most of those seats and most of those cars all around the world are wasted. And yet, when we go, say, on a plane, on a trip to, you know, uh, we're kind of, you know, we rarely waste the suit in our in our space, uh, the space in our suitcase. So why why is that? Why are we so wasteful in our daily commute? Well, it's, there's lots of reasons. It's inconvenient to be more 
than uh, to, and we overbuy capacity. There's all sorts of reasons. But there's, there's a big trend um, that uh, has sort of taken the world by storm, which is called collaborative consumption. And this is uh, a, you know, a trend which we all have been touched by. Here in Dublin, we, we do things like the Dublin bikes, which I think are the, are those the Dublin bikes in the, in the picture? No. So, but anyway, there's something like it. That's part, probably the UK system or the, the Washington system or whatever. So collaborative consumption is all about take, taking better use of shared assets, shared resources. And there's a whole bunch of uh, innovative work that's being done in this, in this uh, throughout the world in transport, in transportation, in uh, things like Airbnb for housing uh, and hotels, Zipcar, uh, GoCar here in Ireland, and, uh, and lots of other uh, air issues of collaborative consumption of, of physical goods and offices and, and co-working spaces, all sorts of things that are really changing the, the way that we, we behave and, the way, and, our, and our useless and our wastefulness. So, you know, this economic model of collaborative consumption works extremely well. And we're all very familiar with collaborative consumption, even in the transport space. Like, how often do you take your personal plane from here to Spain? Not so much. You collaboratively consume that plane. Because why? Because it's actually kind of efficient to do so. You can go online, you can find the schedules and whatnot. You know, it's, it's enough of an expense that you're not, gonna, you're not gonna go buy your own plane and, and, uh, and, and, and whatnot. So the computing power that, that the, has, has become available, that was available for booking hotels or, or planes before, has now come to a cell phone. And all of these applications, like booking a spare room in your house through Airbnb or booking a bike. Now, you know, why would you ever book a bike, like a Dublin bike or whatever? Uh, or why would you ever have the ability to, to do it? It's because the computing power is so cheap that it becomes possible to, to manage these, these resources. So, um, so that, that whole model um, is making it possible for us to improve the way we use our transport systems. And so we're, with Car at Karma, we're taking that for, for carpooling effectively, um, although it's really something a little bit much more dynamic than carpooling. Um, a carpool uh, is, you know, does anyone hear carpool? No. One, two. Uh, so there's, there's not many of us that carpool. And why is that? You know, your neighbors hate traffic, you hate traffic, you know, and you're not, you're not carpooling because why? It's too difficult to share. I mean, the people that don't carpool, I'm sure that there are plenty of students here that walk or take a bike or whatever, but the people that don't carpool, a lot of you guys, myself would be, like I took the car to drive to the train station today because I got up at five o'clock to catch the train from, from Cork. But, but normally, every day, I take karma to work uh, because I live in a place where there's a, a wide enough network of people that do real-time carpooling in, in, in Cork, in Kinsale. So I can, I can take, uh, take uh, real-time carpools every, every day to work. Not, not many of us have that ability because we live in places like Dublin where we don't have the network built up yet. Um, so it's not convenient. So making carpooling easier and more convenient would hopefully lower the barrier for you to do it yourself. So, you know, traditional carpooling is actually, even though there's only a few of us in the room that use it, traditional carpooling is more effective and more uh, used than all other forms of public transit combined in many countries around the world. So in Dublin, we have a decent pub, uh, bus system. Um, or maybe it's not decent, but at least people use it. <laughs> in, in the rest of the, in, in the United States, only 5% of the people uh, use public transit at all. Um, and 10% of the people in the United States carpool. And, uh, and the 5% that use public transit in the United States, that's all forms of public transit. That's buses, subways, commuter rail systems, everything. So carpooling, even though it's rarely used at all, is actually used more than all 
other forms of, of transport. So it is efficient, it is frequently used, but it's rarely used. 70% of the people uh, in the United States drive single occupancy vehicle cars to work. It, and that's because it's, it is a pain, basically. It's a pain. If you're carpooling traditionally, you're carpooling with the same person every day, it puts you on a fixed schedule and, 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 and really, I, and, and that takes all the flexibility you need out of your, out of your life. I mean, you want to take a class on Wednesday nights, so you want to, you want to go to the gym after, or, or go shopping on the way home. So, so our transport systems have evolved into the, the needs that we all want. I mean, people actually make the decision to, to use their single occupancy vehicle car despite all the impact there is on the environment, despite all the proven wastefulness of it all, despite the incredibly high cost, it's one of the highest costs that you have in your life is your car. Behind, behind, it goes behind medical expenses and housing expenses. And then it's your car. <laughs> and it's your transport expense. So, so and there, for some people it's, it's fourth. But anyway, but for most of us, it's, a, it's very, very high up in the most expensive things we do in our entire life. And yet we do it. And why do we do it? It's because it's the best choice for people to drive in a single occupancy vehicle car. People make that choice because it's their best choice. People aren't stupid. It's better than any other option that they have. So people aren't stupid. We have to accept that. <laughs> and yet we have to change their behavior to consider other options. And we do have to provide new capabilities so that, so that other forms of less wasteful, less expensive, more convenient uh, transport are available, or else we're, we're, we're toast. Because I'm sure other people have covered the impact the cars have on our, and, and oil use in transport has on our, on, our, on our ecology and our economy, and it's awful. Um, so we have to fix these things. There are, there are solutions in internet ride sharing services. There's, there's, I'll, I'll, get, I'll give you an example of something that's quite interesting. In two places in the United States, there's something called slugging or casual carpooling. And one of them is Washington, D.C., and another is San Francisco. And in, this, in, this, uh, in these places, there are spots where you just stand by the side of the road, and then cars come by, open their doors, three people hop in the car, and you go on. So and that's the way it works. Every day, you just go to the side. Has, has anyone ever done slugging or casual carpooling in the audience? Hey, we got one. We got two. Good for you guys. It's remarkable. So it's pretty cool. It's actually remarkable, and it totally works. And it works because of the way there's, there's, there's ridiculous sort of uh, chokeholds that sort of focus uh, this. One is that the, there's HOV lanes in the United States, which we don't have here in Ireland, unfortunately. That'd be one thing we could do to help uh, encourage effective uh, use of our roads. But HOV lanes means high occupancy vehicle lanes. So there's, if there's, in, in I think Washington DC it requires three people to be in a, in a car, and then you can go down these super speedy 50 mile an hour, 60 mile an hour, lane rather than the, the five mile an hour choked highway. So slugging is just a remarkable uh, case of the intersection of public policy and, um, and convenience. For consumers, it's much cheaper in terms of time mostly, quality of life, because they save a half an hour a day in the morning and a half an hour a day at night, and that means, means something to people. And it's also cheaper in terms of the cost because you're either splitting the cost of the ride or getting it for free. So the only problem is it only works for about you know, tens, tens of thousands of people a day. So how can we do something like slugging in places where there aren't quite as many incentives and quite as much concentration of traffic? That's what Karma is trying with, with our approach of of actually, so what does karma do? Actually, I'll, I'll give you a little, I'll give you a little s small video, just so you, ha it's one minute. Driving alone is costly, both for the planet and for your pocket. But for many people, 
there are no viable alternatives that take them from where they live to where they work. Passenger up ahead. With the Vego's iPhone app, you can turn your car into a bus and offer your empty seats in real time to potential riders along your route, extending the reach and frequency of public transport options for commuters. Anyone can get a ride using a mobile phone or online and receive the information they need to travel in confidence. The Vego guides the driver to a convenient pickup point and provides the rider with a one-time PIN code as the driver approaches to verify identity and authorize cashless payment. Avego automatically shares the cost of the journey between the driver and rider, saving everyone time and money. Avego combines the freedom and convenience of cars with the efficiency and economy of public transport, organically expanding the network as new riders and drivers join up. And by reducing the number of people who drive alone, you're helping save the planet. So actually that used, by the way, that used the old um, name of our company, which just changed this summer, which was called Avego. It's now called Karma. So that's, that's uh, uh, but that's, it's, so it's an older uh, video. It doesn't show the current capabilities of the system, but it gives you an idea. Driving up. Oops. So, um, so there's lots of difficulties with this approach, and I'm not going to get into too much uh, detail here because uh, we'll probably like to talk about some other things in transport. Um, but one of the main, you know, main problems really is it's so difficult to obtain critical mass in any, in any given area. And to get a high enough concentration of people on the transport corridors so that when people try, it always works for them. And um, so that's what Karma is doing in a few selected places around the world. Um, once in, in, San Francisco, in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, in Austin, Texas, in Bergen, Norway, and uh, we have a, a bit of a, a critical mass in Cork, uh, in certain communities in Cork, um, and uh, just trying to build up a critical mass so that we can introduce this radical new way of transport. Um, you know, when you think about the needs of a transport network, it has to reflect the, obviously, the world that it's been b built into and who it needs to serve. And that means that the sprawl, the urban sprawl that we all have developed throughout most of the, w the world um, is, a, is a real problem in terms of developing those things of critical mass. Um, the, all the feeders, the feeder branches that make for, you know, suburban life actually make it difficult to get enough of a critical mass in any given moment to get enough people um, you know, to, to uh, share the ride and share the commute. Especially, not, not so much, I mean, because effectively any road that's carrying more than I think it's a thousand people an hour actually is probably a good target for like this type of use. But, um, uh, but, uh, but it's still difficult to get all those people queued up in the, with the same app, the same uh, capability at the same time. So that's, that's why it's a, a bit of a challenge in, in building it. We had an activity uh, that happened over the summer, which was really fantastic for, for Karma, which was the union went on strike uh, for the public transport network in, in San Francisco. It was the BART strike. And so a couple hundred thousand people were without uh, transport uh, for actually a couple of periods uh, because it happened more than once actually. And so what we saw uh, during that time was that we had a mass adoption of our, of our technology and, our, and our, uh, all of these areas shown in red uh, are areas where there was excellent transport services provided by the Karma uh, app. Um, and so if you were going from Concord to San Francisco or from San Rafael down to San Mateo, odds are you'd probably be okay. But if you were perhaps going, well, certainly if you were going from Brentwood to Novato or something, it, it, you know, you'd have to actually probe into this map in a little bit more detail to know whether or not you had rides available. But it was phenomenal uh, for, for, a, uh, for the company because we built up overnight thousands and thousands of people that were using the app and proved that we, got, uh, we were able to get enough traction and critical mass. And the, the challenge for, for Karma is to duplicate and extend this 
over and over again and to make and lower the barriers uh, for people. So that even when there aren't public transit strikes, that uh, it's still the best option for people to get to work. Um, so if I look at a, a, a place like Seattle, it, one of the things that's interesting about any sort of um, crowdsourced approach um, or collaborative consumption approach to, to new um, transport models is that it's by necessity, it's a bottom up rather than a top down approach. When the, in Dublin, when they're thinking about building the Lewis system or a train system, they say this is where the train is going to go from and to. They, they even do zoning around it. But we, we operate in a completely different way. We just base the availability of the transport network on what people are on the system effectively. And so in Seattle, at 6 o'clock in the morning, these are the places where you can get from and to using the transport network. So if you're coming from south of the city, you know, no luck. But at 7 o'clock, there's a lot more areas that you can, that you can reach out to far, from farther out, et cetera. And uh, th this type of bottom-up visualization of what a transport network looks like is very, very different than any, any style of how transport network planning has ever been done before. Because it's real time and because it's bottom-up rather than top-down. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, and it's also very dynamic, um, uh, as, as this shows, because the routes change by hour by hour. But there's no wastefulness in this whole network, because unlike a transport network like buses or, or trains, where, where they have a rush hour, and then they run tr empty trains or empty buses throughout the day, this is always used and filled when, they're, when the best uh, times are uh, you know when it, when it's best for the people that are that are working and commuting. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that could be done in public policy to support this idea of real time carpooling, um, and uh, and that's this is a list of that. And if anyone is interested, you can you can uh, contact me and I'll give you the this uh, presentation. Um, there's other forms of, uh, of uh, efficient use of public transport networks, and, and I'll just show a couple of things which I really think we could do more of even here in Ireland. Uh, park and rails, well, maybe not so much in Ireland because there's not enough population in Ireland, but these, these park and rail facilities uh, is, is, a, you know, uh, is a great uh, you know, way of, of doing it. You can see this is one in, in Millbrae, California, and uh, it takes you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of vehicles off the road, uh, which has a lot of societal benefit. Here's, an, here's a really uh, innovative way of thinking about it. You know all those clover leaves with all that wasted uh, space inside the clover leaves? You know, I know we don't have that many clover leaves in Ireland, but uh, clover leaf is, is uh, you know, where you have the exit, from, exit ramp from a, you, everyone know what a clover leaf is more or less? Yeah, you know what it is now. So what they what they what they do in this in a few places around the world, but I just think it's a brilliant idea, is to have park and rides built into the clover leaves, and I just I just love this because it's just such a uh, innovative way of getting people to drive less, give them access, and have lots of uh, available. So the buses, for example, would actually stop off at this at this clover leaf. Uh, on the way th through to, to their destination. Or you could do par park and rides, van pools, and uh, casual carpooling, um, the kind of real-time carpooling that we, that we have as well. So I'd like to just sort of leave you with one little um, presentation, a, a three-minute video, talking about how change is made. And, uh, and then uh, I'll, so I'll, sh I'll show you this. Um, if you have, if you haven't seen it before, I'm sorry, but it's worth seeing again. It's an internet uh, video. Can you hear this? If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. 
he publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is um, how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So, so, I mean, I think, isn't that great? Isn't that really great? I love that video. And, um, you know, the, what was it, the shirtless, shirtless guy, you know, um, took a lot of courage to be the shirtless guy, right? But not, you know, not as much uh, impact until the whole crowd, uh, you know, came out and, and joined in. That's what our challenge is, to have a whole crowd come out and join in. And it's also about just not just not just trying once, but also recognizing, like people often think that you either, you either succeed or you fail. That's a complete falsehood as most successful people know. So what the real truth is, is you fail, you fail, you fail, and then you succeed. So whatever it is, whatever change you're trying to achieve, um, just keep at it, keep trying, keep improving your solution, and hopefully you'll get your followers and you'll get your market change. Thanks very much. It was really inspirational and uh, excellent, brilliant lecture. Thank you so much. And I think that we should all leave here thinking about how we can actually really make change and affect change. And probably the MBA leadership programs in Harvard or all around the world just need to see that. Then they're done. So I says, I'm going to ask the first question and we'll open the floor to everybody else. But I suppose something that I was thinking about when you were showing Carmen how to do it was about personal safety. Now, when I was younger, closed ears to my parents, I used to hitch on lips. Yeah. And probably the weirdest lift I ever hitched was in Donegal from a Cluse farm and a tractor to Glenty's nightclub, where we were all dancing like that. But, do you worry a little at all about people's safety? Is this, is this how do you safeguard against yeah. that? Yeah, so, uh, so I think that's a, that's a great question, and, and I think it's a normal fear that most people have. You know, any change is instantly gets us to think about the, 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 the downsides first, and we're always thinking about the downsides first. Um, I remember even as a kid when I was, um, when I was growing up, I grew up in upstate New York in a farm, farm community. And I would hear about all this stuff in New York City and, 
and the subway and Bernie Getz was around at the time and you know there were you know people were being mugged all the time. Actually, it was a pretty bad time to be in New York City. Uh, but you know, so when I actually went to New York City for the first time and got into the subway, I was expecting that I'd have to hang back, that somebody would be pushing me off in front of the train. I mean, like you would, because that's what you read about, and that's what you hear. And, and so the, the, the first pe thing people jump to is the horrific, exceptional cases. And, um, and I think that's what, that's what everyone always does, uh, does have to have that fear. You have to be able to deal with that fear. And, and, and so, for example, and prove that it, the, the fears are unfounded. I mean, did you guys all hear that three Teslas uh, have had accidents and the batteries have gone on fire? Have you guys heard that? So, oh my God, three Teslas have had car fires out of 75,000 cars. It's actually, it's actually six times less than the average number of, of cars that have car fires. So it's six times safer than all the other cars that have car fires. And yet, what we're hearing is the exception, and the the, and nobody's been injured actually in all those, in all those uh, fires, versus those with, when a gasoline tank blows up, it actually could actually maybe hurt you a little bit. I'm sure somebody will eventually get killed in a Tesla uh, because of some design issue, but when when there are I think about, what it was it's 20 cars an hour or something like that that go on fire around the, in the United States alone. Uh, and so people look at the exception. So how do we make sure that the exception is not the rule uh, with, with karma? For example, um, with hitchhikers, the, and even when you get into a taxi, the old style taxis, you don't really know who you're getting in the, in the vehicle with. You don't know how reputable they are, or you know, are they gonna really rip you off or take you to the right place. But with karma, we actually don't allow strangers to ride with strangers. So we only allow known and trusted people to ride with them. They know each other, but they're both tracked into the system, they're both tracks. We have a phone number, we, have a we know where they started, we know where they got off. It's actually far safer than ever getting on a bus. It's far safer than going and walking out onto the street when you leave this building. Because who could be out there when you hit the street? Have you ever done a shared ride before? Yes. Every time you get in an elevator, you're doing a shared ride. <laughs> so, what is, what, what can we do to, you know, reduce the perception of fear? We can have rated, rated passengers, rated drivers, you know, we can have, you know, uh, the ability to, uh, to just to show them what the safety record is. So, for example, in slugging and in casual carpooling, these, these things which have no benefits of the technology that I've described, <coughs> there's been one incident in 20 years where there was a carjacking. And the car was recovered the next day. And you know, there, was no, there, was ne there, there is no statistical um, validation behind any of the fears that we, that we have. There's also just, just sort of a, I know that we've all seen Halloween, the, the Friday the 13th, and all those sort of hitchhiker movies. It's just a great scenario, and people latch on to that dream of, or that fear. But it's actually one of those unfounded fears. I take karma every day, never had an incident. I think I'm convinced that for sure. Yeah. So I'm sure, do we have questions? Yeah. So uh, yeah, actually though, but you know, uh, to make it fun, you know, so the, the shirtless guy did a, 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 a great uh, thing there. He showed it's fun. Everybody got the idea. Um, it is fun. I, I, I actually love the mode of transport that karma is. So like it's, it's great. I mean, I, we, I can have five or six different people who are driving me during a, a given week. I often choose a, a similar group of people, but um, it's always fun to meet people and have a, a bit of a conversation rather than just being stuck in tra traffic. Um, so it, it is about um, you know, having the experience be more engaging for people, having people know what's possible. So there, is, uh, you know, there, there needs to be visualization so people know. Like it's, 
like a transport network is hard to understand in general, even trying to get around with a Dublin bus in, in, in Dublin, forget about it, like you have to ask somebody. Um, but if you can convey that information uh, in, a, in an easy way and, and have the computer just facilitate it in a really easy way, it's all about, you know, it's all about the usability being fantastic and easy and simple and flexibility. And it's all about, um, you know, uh, the economics as well. I mean, it's great economics. The, the benefits just keep pouring on. So for us, like, uh, the people that adapt the system and use it are religious nuts, basically. They love it, and they keep using it over and over and over and over again. You know, thousands of, of riders in places like Bergen, Norway, and things like that, preaching about it to their friends. So, so to some extent, it's about having enough people know it and share it. One word of caution, like, you know, it takes a while. Like, when we did the street mapping thing, you know, uh, like I was describing, it took us seven years to hit the first million years. It only took another three years. It may seem slow going for, you know, when you're just adding, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of users. Because not everybody's yet doing it. In years time, if you have a billion people using the technology, you've changed the planet. And that's, that's good enough. Uh, hi there. Oh, there's somebody with a mic. Oh, you, sir. You. I can be louder. Uh, my name's Kevin McGinney. I run a commodity business in Switzerland. So yeah. Completely unrelated. Uh, I have a question. When you poll the users, when they initially become users and then maybe more seasoned users, yeah. what do they describe as their motivations for being users? Yeah, so um, there's, this, there's a mix of use, a mix of cases. So a lot of people, it's just the convenience. Um, uh, you know, parking is, is a pain. In, a lot of our users are cent center city. A lot of them, oh, OK, so what's the range of uses? One is this time savings. So in any place where there's HOV lanes, or you know, uh, yeah, I guess you, you know what HOV lanes are now. So anywhere there's HOV lanes, that's a huge motivator. That's, so maybe 30% of our, our users are just from HOV lane, the time savings that they have uh, by sharing, by car sharing, car uh, ride sharing. Uh, another, another group, and these are key, key, key people because they're fanatics and zealots, and they share hugely, um, is the environmental group. The, the main, the, it doesn't motivate a lot of people, um, but those users that do are incredibly, incredibly persistent. And, um, and so, you know, maybe I'd say 15 or 20 percent of our users just are coming at it from a strictly environmental viewpoint, but they share so avidly that they become a core of a, of a community of users that just, that's been great for us. Economics is, is another, and just the availability of, of, like for example, like even in Cork, you get cheaper parking rates when you carpool with the, car, the, the job, uh, with the um, parking lots. Q Park is the <coughs> leading provider of uh, parking lots in Cork. And so we have a deal with them. It's five euro to park when you're carpooling versus the, it could be 18 euro if you're paying by the hour or day or whatever. So, so there's some economic motives for, for some people. And of course, it's much cheaper just when you're splitting the cost of the, of the journey. So the driver makes 85% of whatever is charged, the rider. The, so the rider and the driver sort of split the charges. And Karma takes a tiny fraction of that. So we take like 15% to pay our costs for doing all the things that we do. So and then so but but the vast majority goes straight into the driver's wallet. Eighty-five percent of the of the, what, the whatever the rider pays goes into the driver's wallet. We have time for just one more question. I'm sure you can ask Sean over lunch any of the questions that people have. We just have to. Some of the kids. Somebody has a mic. I'm afraid. Oh, the mic. I want the kids too. Yeah. <laughs> Go right. ahead. Maybe we can do both. Then. <laughs> um, Simon McDonald. City University of New York. Yeah. Um, very quickly, um, I was unclear whether you said there was a reputational element or not, because uh, as an Airbnb host, yeah. reputation is huge. what you live and die by. Yeah. And when your reputation goes higher and you get more reviews, 
Yeah. Then you get more. Yeah, actually, I think the even if you have like a one to five stars, and because I'm talking that's, more and more benign. We have all that, and so and definitely the people that see, wow, this person has carried 700 people. You know, they say, okay, that guy's you know obviously fine. So people will perhaps tend to go with uh, with people that have a lot more rides. Uh, you know that they've they, they've offered. Um, so so. Uh, so there's that element, but there's reviews. Every, every time you use the software, it gives you the chance to review your rider or driver. You give it five stars or one star. If you give it one star, you'll never be matched with that person again, and it obviously affects their overall rating in the system. So, uh, but we see very little use of, uh, you know, very few people that are, have bad uh, ratings, actually, to be honest. And, and the other question very briefly was, um, I'm trying to think about the public policy implications of this because um, in New York what's happening, a, a similar exchange of information is happening in parking. So a lot of on-street parking is given away for free. And uh, so people are selling their parking space. I'm meeting in five minutes. Uh, another car is cruising around looking for parking. And they buy information as to where the parking space is going to be. Yeah. The public policy implication of that is it's going to make it easier for hopefully as an advocate of, and uh, a researcher of, of um, parking, uh, that uh, uh, the public policy implication is that the, the government's going to be able to charge for that parking space now because it's, there's already a, a secondary market happening. Yeah. So the government will be able to capture that revenue. So yeah. it makes it more acceptable that it's already happening. So I'm just wondering if there's any sort of implications from yeah, like, I mean, I, I think there's, I'd, I'd say that that is a tertiary market effect. Like, it'll, it's, it'll be important, but when you have, and, and it's, a, it's a separate need, and these things will only sort of intersect when either one of the movements is big enough. Like, um, so, so, you know, when, at some point those will intersect and there will probably be better uh, technolog technological linkages so that you could tie that in better and have uh, you know, you know, more uh, parking available. We have had offers, you know, in many cases of, of campuses where, uh, you know, corporate campuses or uh, cities where they make uh, ride sharing spots available just in the city center uh, for people that do this kind of activity for free. That is an, a, an additional motivator, and we highly recommend people who have the, you know, the capability to do it. Um, do it. Um, other companies have already done that with cities in Ireland, like Go Go Car, um, and that works extremely well for for them. Zip cars is a similar thing in, in a lot of cities. These children, these kids here. I'm sorry. Make sure that you're happy. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, just on the critical mass uh, point. How do you start off at the very start in a city? Like, if you were to try starting in Dublin tomorrow, you know, how would you go about doing it? Yeah, so like, if we were starting in Dublin tomorrow, we would probably pick one or two, you know, uh, what, we'd pick one corridor to really concentrate on. And so you'd pick a, a commuter town, like a Navin or something like that, where there's a, you know, it's a, it's a difficult commute for people, and the, there's a lot of people who go from Navin to city center, and you'd, you'd, you'd choose it, that corridor, you'd start there, you'd popularize it there, you'd market it there, you'd have you know, a lot of uh, activity there just to raise awareness. Um, another way is to choose a destination. Like we were, you know, Intel is really very interested in doing this and they're the largest corporate uh, campus in Ireland uh, with their lease facility. We haven't really just gotten time to carve it out and make it work with them yet. But that's another approach, is just to, to take a place where 5,000 or, or 7,000 people are going and then just try to, uh, to, to show all the over, overlaps and, and make it available for people that way. Okay. Maybe you can come again and ask questions. I'm conscious that we have the caterers getting very flustered outside. But my, my final answer is, is that women in science the luncheon is on the fourth floor. Everybody else, I believe, is outside. And I want to say thank you so much to our speakers this morning. It's wonderful. And I'm sure there's more questions that come up. Tonight.